Live from Quito, Ecuador, I'm Sweeney Gray and this is From the South, the daily news brief from Tell Us Your English. And we start this new edition right now. Peru's defense minister is the latest member of the government to resign over the pardon granted by President Pedro Pablo Kaczynski to the former leader Alberto Fujimori. Jorge Nieto is the third member of the cabinet to step down in protest at the pardon, following the example set by the Minister of Culture, Salvador del Solar, and the Interior Minister, Carlos Basombrio. A group of Peruvians protested against the pardon outside the Organization of American States in Washington on Wednesday. As the political fallout from the measure continues, there are reports that the leader of the Fuerza Popular Party, Keiko Fujimori, has removed the faction led by her brother Kenji from the party's group in Congress. Kenji and his supporters blocked a move in Congress to impeach President Kaczynski allegedly as part of a deal to secure his father's pardon. In Chile too, human rights organizations and migrants have been protesting outside the Peruvian embassy over the release of Alberto Fujimori, who was serving 25 years in prison for corruption and human rights abuses. They delivered a letter calling for solidarity with the protesters in Peru and saying that the pardon is an appalling example of impunity for the whole of Latin America. This pardon hurts us. It hurts us what the Peruvian families have been through. The victims that until today haven't received justice. It's a disastrous precedent, not only for the Peruvian people, but also for all the human rights victims of Latin America's dictatorships. Today, as a courageous act, the Chilean people and the National Coordinator of Human Rights are here to support the Peruvian people. Justice is a necessity for the people. Human rights organizations in Peru are working on several legal angles to revoke the pardon granted to Alberto Fujimori. Since President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski freed Alberto Fujimori, family members of those killed in Barrios Altos and La Cantuta University during Fujimori's regime have been working on several legal actions to revoke this humanitarian pardon and make the former president serve his 25-year sentence. This is the only way we can make things happen. All the different governments have never listened to us. What we want is justice and to be heard. They've reached out to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, where an audience will take place on February 2nd, an opportunity for the victim's defense to present its case against Fujimori's pardon. The pardon was based on a political move, and not on a humanitarian decision. Also, this broke several international processes that are regulated by Peru's law. Former President Fujimori doesn't have any serious health problems to be granted a humanitarian pardon. Human rights organizations filed a complaint against this pardon in order for Fujimori to face trial for other crimes, like the killing of six campesinos in Pativilca village. Is it possible that the government could stop a legal process that denies victims the truth and ensure that all those responsible are judged and punished after due process? We don't think so. That is why we are asking the criminal court to control this legal process. Meanwhile, several social organizations called for a new demonstration to reject the pardon to Fujimori on January 11. And our correspondent in Lima, Jaime Herrera, has new updates. Yet another high-profile official has resigned from the government of Pedro Pablo Kuczynski after the political crisis that has been hitting the country for the last few weeks. This time, it is the Minister of Defense, Jorge Nieto Montesinos, that joined Salvador del Solar, Ministry of Culture, and Carlos Basombrio, Ministry of the Interior, to reject the pardon of President Kuczynski granted to Alberto Fujimori. 
Other public servants have also resigned, especially those working for human rights government programs. This is the case of Roger Rodriguez, former official at the Ministry of Justice, who criticized the government's decision and said that Fujimori didn't comply with all that was needed to ask for a pardon, and that the former president has no serious health conditions putting his life in danger. Until today, 14 officials have resigned from the Pedro Pablo Kuczynski's government, who has been in office for just one year and a half. People are now in more demonstrations in the coming days to reject the pardon. The number of dead from Tuesday's bus crash in Peru has risen to 51. Six people survived the accident. Rescue work is continuing at the site where the bus plunged 100 meters off the coastal road north of Lima, with large numbers of military specialists brought in to help. Pope Francis joined those who sent messages of sympathy for the relatives of the victim. The Pope will visit Peru on January 18th. There has been an enormous number of troops deployed here. Rescue personnel, especially trained members of the Navy, have been used. Today, we have been here since 7.30 in the morning, starting all of the preparation for the maneuvers to rescue the victims that were in the lower part. The protests against the labor reforms and the economic policies of the Argentine government continued this Thursday with a 24-hour strike by state workers. The latest protest comes as the government announced an increase in fares on public transport by as much as 60% on Wednesday. It says the increase is needed to cover a reduction in subsidies to the, to the transport system. In the coming days, President Macri is expected to announce increases in, in, in the price of fuel, electricity, water and gas. It has been almost two years since we modified the transport rates. For this reason, we are carrying out this gradual and staggered updating, which will start as of February 1st. With the increases in the cost of education, gas, food, everything is expensive now. And the truth is that I'm still looking for a job, so I hope to get lucky because we know that complicated economic times are coming. Egaro Esteban is with the striking state workers in Buenos Aires and sent this report. Argentine state workers from all over the country have stopped their activities for the next 24 hours to mobilize from downtown Buenos Aires to the Ministry of Planning as a form of protest against Mauricio Macri's decision to fire public workers and to close public institutions as one of his neoliberal measures. Around 1,200 workers were fired at the end of 2017 and at the beginning of 2018. This forecasts an intense year for social protests and workers' mobilizations. Not only state workers, but also labor unions and workers' associations from all over the country, starting from the current withdrawal of thousands of jobs by Mauricio Macri's government, which also affects the private sector. Puerto Rico's governor, Ricardo Rosselio, says at least 150,000 Puerto Ricans left after Hurricane Maria hit the island more than three months ago. The announcement comes after Rosselio met with Senators Richard Blumenthal and Chris Murphy to discuss the recovery efforts around the island and what to do next to bring the island back to normal. During this press conference, the governor said that the number of people who left the island ranges between 150,000 or 250,000. And we have more news in a minute, so stay with us. Welcome back. The European Union's foreign policy chef, Federica Mogherini, is on a two-day visit to Cuba to help strengthen the economic and political ties between the two sides. Speaking to the media, Mogherini has said that the EU rejects North America's sanctions against Cuban citizens and cannot accept unilateral measures that impede or restrict European economic relations with the island. 
She also said that ties between the EU and Cuba are stronger than ever. Regardless of the changes of policies in Washington, the message I'm bringing here is that the friendship and the relation with the European Union is here to stay. It's solid, it's stable, it's reliable. It has always existed and today we are for the first time ever into a legal framework that allows us to uh, expand areas of cooperation. Our correspondent in Havana, Laura Prada, has more details for us. Hello, yes, nice to greet you from Havana. Indeed, the High Representative of the European Union, Federica Mogherini, started yesterday her visit to the island. This is her third visit to Cuba, and uh, in this uh, time she will be meeting with uh, government uh, authorities. Yesterday, for example, she met with the Foreign and Commerce Minister, Rodrigo Malmier, to see which areas of cooperation were suitable for the European Union and uh, the areas that already uh, Cuba and the European Union were uh, exchanging, uh, if they could be extended. Also, she met with the Culture Minister Abel Prieto and uh, she gave a conference at the Colegio San Jerónimo of Old Havana uh, where she uh, stated that the U.S. blockade against Cuba is illegal and obsolete. She also said that the European Union will still be uh, by Cuba's side uh, holding, holding her hand uh, in this time. And while uh, countries build walls and close uh, windows, the uh, European Union will build bridges and open doors so cooperation can go uh, in both sides. Uh, uh, Yesterday, after this conference, she uh, walked around Old Havana accompanied by the Eusebio Leal. And today, on today's agenda, is very uh, interesting because in the morning, she just few uh, a few moments ago, she met with the uh, president of the National Assembly, Esteban Lasso Hernandez, and she's about to meet with the foreign minister of Cuba, Bruno Rodriguez, where they will be talking about the uh, cooperation agreement and political dialogue uh, between Cuba and the European Union to see uh, what in, if it could be uh, implemented uh, completely uh, in this moment. Uh, afterwards, in the afternoon, is expected a press conference where the high representative will be giving the results of her visit to the island and uh, what can be expected in the future of this relationship between European Union and Cuba. This is all I have for now, but I'm sure we'll be getting back together. I get back to you. We thank Laura Prada for that report. In Mexico City, the National Regeneration Movement's leader, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, is presenting his security plan to deal with the violence in Mexico. Our correspondent, Pablo Perez, brings us more details in this report. Right now, the Proximus candidate for the left-wing party, the National Renovation Movement, Andres Manuel López Obrador, is presenting his security plan. He says that the, the, the actions that have been implemented for the last decade did not work and did cause more violence for the people of Mexico. His proposal as is that he will not fight violence with violence, but attack first the social problems that are the uh, at the roots of the violence that the uh, Mexican people is living right now. He is yet to present his uh, uh, security secretary, but this is the information so far in from the campaign of the uh, pre-candidate Andres Manuel López Obrador of the National Renovation Movement. The campaign for Ecuador's national referendum on February 4th has begun. Social and political organizations are now forming strategies to win over the electorate. More details in this report. All the month long campaign for either the yes or the no. In defense of human rights, and one of only four registered in support of a no vote, explain why they have chosen to stand against the government's proposals. This will be a campaign for and by the people, by women, by the youth, who are aware that this whole thing is an unnecessary whim, 
We do not need an unconstitutional and illegal referendum. Similar organizations, along with assembly members of Alianza País, who support the views of Rafael Correa, the leader of the citizen revolution, will be campaigning for a no vote in the referendum. One of their main arguments is what they call President Lenin Moreno's betrayal of the party's principles. We will vote no, rejecting President Lenin Moreno's betrayal. He got support by aligning himself with the victories of the past 10 years and using Rafael Correa's citizen revolution only to turn into the worst of traitors. Other organizations and political players who have long been against the citizen revolution have also started to travel to different cities supporting a yes vote in the referendum. Today marks a real and concrete possibility for us to regain a multi-party system. Ecuadorians will once again go to the polls to answer seven questions, five of which involve constitutional reforms, while the remaining two are questions about oil drilling and land speculation. Brazil's state oil company Petrobras will pay almost $3 billion to settle a legal complaint filed by the investors in a New York court after the Lava Jato corruption scandal broke out. The settlement, the defense says, does not recognize that the state company was involved in any irregular process. Brazilian authorities have returned more than $400 million to the company, recovered from people cooperating with the investigation. As you've heard earlier in this newscast, the Pope is soon to visit Peru and Chile, and preparations for his visit are in full flow. A planned mass in the Chilean capital of Santiago is expected to attract more than 500,000 people. Banners decorated the cathedral where the pontiff will hold mass and builders are working on in O'Higgins Park where Francis will give a sermon. He will also visit the cities of Tumuku and Iquiquai before heading to Peru where he will stop in Lima, Puerto Maldonado and Trujillo. The chance of a worker obtaining a pension in Colombia has become an almost unattainable dream. The obstacles put in place by the government and private entities continue to increase, as our correspondent has been finding out. Worker and pensioners unions, the proposed initiative meant to increase the retirement age, as well as the number of contributions required to retire, is yet another attack against the working class by the government, big business, and private pension funds. The government argues pensioners represent a significant drain of public resources, and this is a solution to the fiscal deficit. What we have discovered in the private pension system is that there is not a high number of pensioners. But we can see that it is these private funds that are pushing to extend their retirement age so that they don't have to pay anyone. A los efectos de prácticamente no pensionar a nadie en el corto plazo. In the past, the pension system relied upon the Colombian government. By creating Law 100, sponsored by former President Alvaro Uribe Vélez, private funds took over management of the resources paid for by Colombian citizens to eventually retire. It was a deal for private businesses. The private sector enriched itself through the savings and hopes of individuals who plan to retire with those funds. Workers' unions and the general population believe the solution to the pension deficit is for the government to once again be in charge of these resources, not to raise the retirement age from 65 to 67 years old. We hope this situation is resolved by the government, taking control of the pension system in order to avoid situations like this, which attack citizens' trust. For Colombian business people and the government, the retirement age must increase, and as such, many initiatives have been brought forth to Congress in 2018. This will be a top priority for the government. We'll be back very soon, so stay with us.
Record-shattering cold has gripped much of the eastern United States, causing at least a dozen deaths so far. The Arctic freeze has led to the closure of schools and is affecting travel throughout the region. Officials have opened warming centers in the Deep South and have urged the residents to alert social services if they see people stuck outside in the harsh temperatures. The weather forecasters have warned of a major winter storm later this week. And our correspondent in Washington, Francesca Emanuel, filed this report. In estos momentos nos encontramos a menos 8 grados Celsius. Right now we are facing a temperature of minus 8 degrees Celsius. And authorities have already announced that since Tuesday, at least 11 people have died. Experts said that the worst is yet to come. On Wednesday night, we are facing a climate phenomenon called bombogenesis, which causes a dramatic lowering of pressure and a rapidly intensifying bomb cyclone is generated and turned into a winter hurricane. Authorities of several states like New York have asked public workers not to attend work on Wednesday. In Georgia, a state of emergency has been declared and many schools had to close. This cold wave is affecting nearly 100 million people in Mexico, the United States and Canada. It has been such a harsh winter that in Canada, they even had to protect penguins from their outdoor space in a zoo because the temperature was below 25 degrees and they couldn't stand it. But not only the center and northern part of the U.S. is affected. Even in the state of Florida, there are areas where in in the next days, experts are forecasting that it could snow. This is the freezing situation now in the states, which has led authorities to stay alert and encourage citizens to take care of their health and avoid more fatal casualties like the 11 deaths that have already occurred. U.S. President Donald Trump's lawyers have written to his former strategist, Steve Bannon, saying that he has violated a non-disclosure agreement after Bannon had called Donald Trump Jr.'s meeting with Russians treasonous. In the latest development, Trump's lawyers are seeking to stop the release of a new book by Michael Wolff containing explosive insights into his presidency. The letter demands that the author and the book's publisher immediately cease and desist from any further publication, release or dissemination of the book or excerpts from it. The book supposedly questions Trump's fitness for office and is due for release on January 9th. And we go now to our correspondent in Washington, Jorge Hestoso. Well, Hello, Jorge. Thank you so much for Regarding that uh, explosive book uh, uh, that is really shaking uh, a very cold day here in Washington, the lawyers of uh, President Trump is uh, sending a letter to Mr. Stephen Bannon asking him to stop to talk. And they say that they are I initiating uh, legal action and it's going to be imminent. Uh, most definitely, this is creating uh, shock waves here. Uh, it's throwing a White House in chaos. It's showing a very uh, childish, that's their words, President Trump. And uh, most definitely, uh, the reaction also of Mr. Stephen Bannon today, it has been continued to praise President Trump, while President Trump is continued to tweet against Stephen Bannon. On the other hand, we know that uh, Paul Manafort, that was the former uh, campaign director of Mr. Trump, has sued the special counsel uh, Robert Mueller, uh, saying that uh, the vice, uh, the assistant, uh, basically the, 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 the assistant uh, justice uh, minister, what we call it in Latin America, uh, he was not having the authority to name Stephen as uh, M Mr. Mueller as, um, a as a special prosecutor, and therefore that is a new development trying, in a way, to slow down that investigation. According to Mr. Stephen Bannon, this investigation is going through uh, one only direction and is getting closer and closer to the inner circle of President Trump, and that direction is, in his words, money laundering. We get back to you. Thank you so much for that update. We've been speaking to Jorge Hestoso, our Washington correspondent. Now let's have a look at some of the other stories making headlines across the world. 
Winter storm Eleanor has swept across Europe causing widespread damage and disruptions that have hampered transport including air travel and cut power to tens of thousands of people. Three deaths have been reported so far. Two people drowned on Spain's northern Basque coast after being swept away by a huge wave and a skier was killed by a falling tree in the French Alps. I was afraid last night. I was afraid the roofs would fly away, that the window panes would be torn off. It was really quite impressive last night. Ousted South Korean President Park Gwen hye is to be charged with accepting millions of dollars worth of bribes from the state spy agency, according to South Korean media. Park allegedly received between $47,000 to $188,000 from the National Intelligence Service every month, soon after her swearing in early 2013 until mid-2016. Park has been hit with new charges on top of those that could send her to prison for life. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has said in news conference that Japan's security environment is at its severest since World War II, referring to North Korea's escalating nuclear and missile threat. Last year, North Korea one-sidedly escalated its provocative actions through its nuclear weapons and missiles program. It is not an exaggeration to say that the security environment surrounding our country is at its severest since World War II. One of the seven wonders of the world, Taj Mahal, could limit the number of visitors to 40,000 a day, each visit up to three hours, according to the Indian Ministry of Culture. These are among several crowd management measures the ministry intends to take as they notice the Taj Mahal is drawing uncontrollably high crowds on weekends and holidays. Ten workers have been killed in a fire in a shoe factory near the Siberian town of Is Iskitim in Russia. According to the initial reports, most of the people killed are Chinese, and two from Kazakhstan. The victims tried to extinguish the fire before the arrival of firefighters, but they could not, and they died of smoke inhalation. The cause of the blaze may have been a short circuit. The fire has been localized. Now we're finishing extinguishing the fire and exploring the site. We have enough personal equipment to deal with fire. 11 special vehicles and 8 additional vehicles. 56 firefighters are involved in the firefighting operation. Emergency and security services are talking to the building's owners to find out where those workers who work inside are now. We've come to the end of this daily news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website, telusyourtv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I am Sweeney Gray. Thank you so much for watching.